And when they asked me to teach, they wanted me to do a lecture. And I thought, lectures? I don't do lectures. <laughs> so I came up with this program on Little Basketry Survives the Test of Time. And in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, at Aramont, I had a tape recorder, a slide projector, my props, myself. So I'm going to take you way, way back in time and bring you to the present. So we'll start with back in Europe before it was Germany. The Amana colony traces its beginnings to 1714 in Europe with the writings and teachings of two individuals, Irpat Ludwig Gruber and Johann Friedrich Rock, who came to believe that God communicated to his followers through an inspired individuals just like the prophets of old. These individuals were called Wurzeit, meaning instrument. The religious sect called themselves the community of true inspiration, a faith based on pietism. Basket makers were among this group of pietists who protested the dogmatism of the Lutheran Church, refused to conform to its ritual, and declined to perform military duty or to take the legal oath. Consequently, they were persecuted, imprisoned, and flogged. Spiritual leaders arose and prophesied. Their sayings were faithfully recorded by scribes and published as sacred testimonies. Inspired leader Christian Metz, also a young carpenter, first conceived the idea of leasing large German estates in common as a refuge for the faithful in 1830s. The Ronneberg Castle estate in Hessen was one of the safer places the followers gathered. The community of true inspiration looked to the new world for a new home. In 1842, Christian Metz and three followers traveled to America to buy land. 5,000 acres on the former Schenectady Indian Reservation near Buffalo, New York was purchased. Some of the followers could not raise all the money necessary for their passage to the New World or to pay for land. Christian Metz was guided by the Book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 44, 45, that says, And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and good, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. We join Svester Helena, wife of basket maker Martin Troutman, as she packs for their move to America. Ah, I see Martin has his tools ready to pack with our tapes. I better check to make sure he's not forgotten anything. Pastor. Messer. Wrapping iron. Plea for splitting. And the old fashioned prunes. <laughs> <laughs> Where? There is his. his splitting. Where is his shaving mess? Martin has forgotten his shaving mess. I must tell him to get that down here now. Oh dear. Long journey. Ah. Das is our baby mess. I cannot leave this back home. I cannot leave this behind. I have to take this. Martin took such pride in marking it for our first king. Now, we do not know if we would have willows growing in our new home. So, Martin is making dust basket from fresh willow. We will keep it damp and moist, and when we arrive, we can cut it and use it to plant a little couch. Um, what other basket should I take? Ah, my lidded sewing basket. That will hold a lot of precious things as well, my sewing. I should have lots of time to catch up on some money. A trip across the ocean takes more than I am on. We have decided to form a communal system of living, for everyone will share in the business, in the property. We will all work for the community and do what is needed. It's going to be a little scary and be a long journey, but God will be with us. Between 1842 and 1846, more than 800 members immigrated from Hessen to their new home near Buffalo, New York, 
establishing a communal organized settlement where they could be economically self-sufficient and spiritually free. Because no one died or was hurt on the voyage across the ocean, the new home was called Ebenezer, or hitherto the Lord hath helped us. Six villages were established, four in New York and two farming communities in Canada, each with its own store, school, sawmill, woolen mill, flour mill, craft shops including basket making, and its church. Split Oak basket maker Martin Schaup and his two sons Samuel and Tobias from Canada joined the community of True Inspiration in 1845, bringing with them their knowledge of splint basketry. For 12 years, the Inspirationalists labored in the mills and factories and tilled the newly broken fields. With membership growing to over 1,200 people and the Erie Canal increasing the population of nearby Buffalo, Christian Metz was again directed to go forth to find a new home in the West. In 1855, 18,000 acres in the Iowa River Valley of Iowa County, State of Iowa, was purchased. Once again, the community members moved with God's blessing. We again join basket maker Troutman's wife, Elena, as she helps prepare for their journey. When we arrive in our new home in Iowa, we will be very, very busy and hope to plant a willow patch right away. Martin has packed some slips of willows to plant, but it will take dry years before the plant, the willow patch will produce enough willow for us to use. Martin has, Martin has bonded several bases. They will not take much room and fit into other baskets. Have been told that's our new home in Iowa has a river with bluffs of timber for building and fuel, sand quarries, sandstone quarries for building, and clay for brick that is good to use, and rolling meadows, ready to plow without any stones and boulders. They are indeed blessed. The first village on the Iowa Purchase was laid out during the summer of 1855 on a sloping hillside north of the Iowa River. An inspired testimony directed the people to call their village Bly True, remaining faithful. Because of the resemblance between the Bullaf overlooking the site of the new village and the top of a manna described in the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 8, the elders named their first village Amana. Between 1855 and 1862, five more villages were laid out within a radius of six miles from Amana and were named in accordance to their location. West Amana, South Amana, High Amana, East Amana, and Middle Amana. In 1861, the village of Homestead, already a stagecoach stop, was purchased in order to obtain access to a railroad completing the Amana colonies 26,000 acres. Modeled after the country villages of Middle Europe, the homes were clustered together with the church in the center, barns and sheds at one end, factories and workshops at the other. On either side, the orchards, the vineyards, and the gardens. The community took two important steps after moving to Iowa, incorporating under the laws of the state as the Amana Society, and the adoption of a new constitution similar to the Ebenezer Constitution, continuing a communal life of common estate and property. The Schaup split oak basket makers were assigned to the village of South Amana and were made from 1856 to 1915 when Tobias Schaup passed away. Each village was self-sustaining with blacksmith shops, basket makers, bakeries, tinsmith, and other craft people Farming was the principal means of support, but the calico works, woolen mills, grist flour mills, brick and lumber yards offered goods and services to the outside world. Rye straw coiled baskets were made to be used in the bakeries to hold the round loaves of bread while rising before baking. Later, a coiled reed basket replaced the coiled straw basket. Today, the bakeries do not use any baskets for their rising dough. 
Each village had their basket maker, usually an elderly man who no longer could do the hard physical labor. He tended the half acre of willow patches, sorted, wove new baskets that were needed, and repaired baskets in need of repair. Basket maker Martin Troutman died suddenly on his way to evening prayer services in 1884. We now join basket maker Johan Hughes' sister in Hyamana in the year 1890. Your divers stop by to remind Johan that apple harvest will soon be hit and the community will need more apple picking baskets. Das is the apple picking baskets. It has two handles on one side so that you can hang in the tree and we can hang in our ladder. It is shaped so that it is hanging. The apples do not fall out. Dust lid basket is very thick. We can put our apron strings in there and we can put our belts, the guys can put their belts in. Our hands are free for picking. Oh, I see he has finished Spester Kallenberger's basket, knitting basket she brought. She will stop by tomorrow to pick it up. It needed repair. It has one handle and a new replaceable bottom foot. Johan always puts the replaceable foos on his baskets. As he was taught, he takes the piece from the top, goes back in the sides of the basket, weaves a row, and goes forward. Das foot will take the wear and tear of everyday use, and when it breaks, you can pull it off and put it on. Now, why did I come into the... <laughs> oh, to find the real plastic. Yes, this is the year we have the very special communion. The services will take all day. In the afternoon, we sit around the table and are served the wine, only the very best wine served. Then the unleavened bread comes to the church in this basket. The basket has to be made very special with white willow. Johan has done a so good job in marking the basket. But I must not be late. I want to get to the bakery. The reorganization was adopted by the vote and received the signature of every voting member. This step in the community's history will be forever remembered as the great change. Indeed, it was a great change in the life of the people living in the Manor colonies. It meant the passing of the old communal way and the adoption of a new order. It meant a new sense of freedom and a new sense of community responsibility. Many old communal items were auctioned off to pay for new items. Legally, the great change meant the community property was equally distributed among its members in the form of a stock certificate. Each member received one share of Class A common stock, the voting stock, and shares of priority distributive stock for each year of service in the community. With their shares, the members could purchase the homes they were living in and begin a new life. The Amana Church of True Inspiration was separated from the business which was still called the Amana Society. The church retained and conducted the religious part of the church members' lives, and the Amana Society continued the businesses that were profitable by now paying wages to their workers, a whole 10 cents per hour. Some businesses were closed, never to be opened again. Basket shops were one of the businesses that were closed, but Willow Basketry survived. Otto Bondorf, basket maker of East Amana, first worked for the Amana Society Farm Department, later for the woolen mill, and then as a carpenter. When asked why he did not continue weaving baskets, he replied, I had to go out and work for a living. August Reddick, basket maker of Middle Amana, worked for the Farm Department, but during the winter months continued to make baskets. After retiring, August returned to basket making full time selling to the tourist and even to a department store in Cedar Rapids, a city 20 miles away. 
Richard Seifer Jr. had learned basket making from Ludwig Dietrich in Amana and Alvin Werner. After the great change, when the Homestead Basket Shop closed, Richard worked for the woolen mill, but continued to make a few baskets. He was always willing to do the mending of old baskets and is remembered as being surrounded with baskets. I like to pass through the basket shop where my husband used to work. There are lots of memories here. Ah, I see Otto has mastered the twisted white little handle. I remember when Swister Shear brought me a laundry basket very much like this one and needed one handle. Otto was just learning and felt confident that he could do the work. And Swester Shear, oh, that woman, she insisted that the basket had to be repaired and could not wait for my husband Alvin to return to work. Well, Otto made a wonderful handle, but in the process, he ruined a lot of white women. <laughs> Elvin was very pleased with his work, but scolded him for ruining the white willow. You see, only a little bit of white willow is pitted and peeled, and we saved the white willow for the indoor baskets and the very, very special baskets. This is an Easter basket that Elvin made. See the little bit of color? He took his white willows to the woolen mill and dyed them a color. Now, the elders were not very happy, <laughs> but the children felt. <laughs> ah, lots of time Elvin would put the replaceable spikes from the foot up the side of the basket and made it fancy. Now, that was fancy, but not too fancy for the others. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, I need to go to a man to vote for a change in our life. It is a little scary, but the committee has done a good job in dividing the property and providing for all of us. I must not be late. <laughs> After the great change, Philip Dickel of Middle Amana planted willow in what was now his own backyard. While working different jobs, he still found time to make baskets in his spare time. Before the great change, Philip was assigned bookbinding by the elders. Since he wanted to weave baskets, he visited the Middle Amana assigned basket maker, Carl Kiesling, and learned willow basketry on his own. Philip Dickel is the basket maker who brought traditional willow basketry to the present basket makers. In 1973, he gave Joanna Schantz willow slips to plant a willow patch next to the broom and basket shop in West Amana. Two years later, Philip taught Joanna the techniques of willow basketry of the Amana colonies. Four peeled and unpeeled off-the-wall baskets by Joanna. In 1978, Joanna taught Laura Kleinmeier, a sales clerk at the Broom and Basket Shop, the traditional willow basketry techniques. This is a 1994 featured willow basket, an oval buff willow Easter basket shown with the hand dyed eggs. 1995 featured basket, a traditional knitting basket using peeled and unpeeled willow. In 1979, the Amana Arts Guild asked Joanna to teach a willow basketry class. Kathy Kellenberger was a student in that class and returned the next year to help Joanna teach many more classes for the Amana Arts Guild. 1997 featured basket, traditional willow potato basket with a swing handle. 1999 featured basket, traditional clothespin basket using peeled and unpeeled willow. Michelle Schantz, daughter-in-law of Joanna, began making baskets just out of college and has now joined the other three in weaving with willow. Michelle's lidded picnic basket woven from buff and white willow. 
1994, when Penny Clark lived in Fayette, Iowa, she took a rib-style willow basket class from Joe Campbell Amsler. In 2000, after attending several willow weaving weekends at the Amana Arts Guild, Penny moved to Amana. Penny is pictured with a Schaup-style plated basket. Peeled and unpeeled willow lidded backpack by Penny. We now join Joanna Schantz, one of the present day willow basket makers of the Amana colony, as she continues our story. So when he passed away in 1981, at the age of 81, uh, it was important for me to write, research, write, and write down all the history that I could give him, plus the directions for making a traditional German Amana colony basket. So I wrote, Little baskets of the Amanda colonies, and that includes directions in patterns for the six traditional baskets. And ten years later, after a class in Michigan, I came home and decided I needed to write one for the very beginning shop. And we get a bus tour. I had, if I was weeding, I had to get up and let him sit down to show up. <laughs> <laughs> when we would go to the, the park for art festival, and he would be there with me. Uh, he would, when he'd get a basket down and he'd put the removable foot on, he would turn it upside down before the handles were on and stand on it to show how strong it was. So Philip impressed upon me that baskets were made to be used. So you saw pictures in there of four off-the-wall baskets. Well, those are baskets that I make a fancy base and the sides are just maybe an inch, two inches high. And they're baskets that hang on the wall, but they can be pulled off the wall and used. And then this one I made out of all white, playing around with different different techniques and things. And that one, of course, hangs on the wall, too. It's low, and then you get back and pull off. Still has a replaceable bottom foot. And then this basket is, this is one that was done on a mold, and some of the students in the class are putting the, this is English branding. I call this English influence on a German. <laughs> and then the replaceable bottom foot comes through up and kind of puts an additional border on that. Uh, Louise Zuber, one of my sales clerks that worked for me when she was retired from her retired job, <laughs> and her father was the baker in South Amana, and that was, uh, we have an open hearth bakery in Middle Amana that still is existing, but her father was one of the old ones, and he, old ones. And he uh, not only may use the rye straw basket, but he would he would use slough, slough grass. And between South Man and West is a sloughy area, and he could go down and get slough grass. And I have a picture of Louise when she was about three years old in her winter coat, standing by a uh, big stack of slough grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave me one of his baskets where it begins with the rye straw and wood splint, and then it's finished up with slough grass and cane, binder cane. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of a combination of the two jars. How do they use that? The oh, how do they? The what? Oh, they, they make brown loaves of bread, yeah. and they put them in the baskets. The dough. To rise. The dough, yeah. And they would rise in the baskets, and then they would flip them out onto the paddle. Oh, and through the line. years, I've had opportunities to do a lot of basketry, and one very special one was to go to Germany and study under Herr Schneider for eight days, and we had other people. Jackie was in that class, and Bill Reuter and Sally Bordner, and we, four of us, were able to take class from that. And we all made, our first basket was this size. Ooh. We got skiing. Now, Herr Schneider started the very beginning. <laughs> And he showed us how to do all the skiing. Wow. But, um, yeah, it was very time consuming. And this is a skiing basket I made when I got home. Oh, and good. I have not made a skiing basket. <laughs> 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 oh, look at that, that base. Oh. Oh. Every year since our, since our 150 year celebration, uh, before we had a lot of exhibits at the Amanda Arts Guild, but they could only be up for a short time because there were classes going on. We had to take exhibits back. We had basket exhibits. 
And then our, our year of our 150 year anniversary, I remodeled one of my front rooms in my, in my business there and we opened up an exhibit for the coiled, the plated, and the willow baskets of the Men's Society. And um, since then, we've been doing basket classes, not basket classes, we've been uh, doing exhibits there all the time. Every year we kind of have a different thing. <laughs> but it's fun to get baskets from across the country. And one of the, you know, when people come and they make comments or they visit, they, some of them are amazed at what kind of material can be used, how it's used, what it looks like. We have one teacher, uh, Mar Marilyn Moore, lives in Iowa City now. Marilyn Moore. Marilyn Moore. Marilyn Moore. Okay, she sent us a beautiful beaded vest. And she got what one of my sales clerks called the Nose Award. Because it was in a glass case, uh -huh. and every morning, <laughs> Judy had to clean the case because everybody had to know it. <laughs> and Joanne again, but I also want all of you to know this. The reason you're here is because of Joanne. Even though this is not the man, it's those of us, the nucleus of this whole gathering in this room, many of you, the reason you're weaving is because of Joanna. She started it all. Even though maybe I weave a little differently than Joanna, of course. Um, if it wasn't for Joanna, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I know it's Cindy Lee, Nana, Jackie, and many of the rest of you in this room. So thank you, Joanna. So I'm just, just very thankful for all the experiences that I had in the world. Oh, my, my next project, my next week project is I'm weaving my own little pop. <laughs> no. Is that going to be a class? <laughs> <laughs> I'm planning on making a wooden bottom because I don't want to do it. Fair about it. Uh -oh. <laughs> if I don't get it finished in time, I have plenty of little winches and little friends. <laughs> yeah. 